Hi, and welcome to lesson four here in our compound unit. Here we're going to talk about molecular polarity. It's really important that you have a handle on the material that was discussed in lessons two and three of this unit before we go in to have this conversation. Otherwise, it's not gonna make a whole lot of sense. We started talking about polarity in our last unit when we talked about bond polarity. As a reminder, covalent bonds can be either polar or nonpolar. You have this chart on page 15 of your unit six packet, and it always has to do with the electronegativity between the two atoms that are making the covalent bond. Specifically, if the electronegativity difference between those two atoms is less than 0.4, that bond is usually considered to be nonpolar, and if it's between 0.4 and 1.8, it's usually considered to be polar. I hope that this rings some bells for you. If it doesn't, that's a problem, and you should go back and check out lesson 6.4 before you go through this lesson. Molecular polarity is going to take the work that we did when we determined bond polarity and build on it, because a molecule's polarity depends not only upon its bond polarity, but also upon its molecular shape. Specifically, if a molecule has a symmetrical shape, it is going to be a nonpolar molecule, regardless of what its bond polarities are. So the natural question there is, what is molecular symmetry? Molecular symmetry is any structure that cancels out polar bonds, what we call the dipole moments of an atom, so that the overall sum of the sharing is zero. A dipole moment is just the result of a polar covalent bond. You can see it here in this bond between nitrogen and hydrogen. Nitrogen is partially negative and hydrogen is partially positive due to the electronegativity difference. The dipole moment is this arrow which points towards nitrogen, showing that the electrons are going to be shared unequally and spend more of their time around nitrogen than they are around hydrogen. A symmetrical molecule is going to cancel that out. So carbon dioxide is a great example. Carbon dioxide is symmetrical. Even though the bond between carbon and oxygen is somewhat polar, the dipole moments are in equal and opposite directions so that the overall dipole moment in the molecule is zero. If we look at water, we can see that the dipole moments are equal, but they're not in opposite directions. This makes water non-symmetrical, and as a result, water is very polar. Does this make sense? If it doesn't, take a moment and write down any questions that you have before we move on. Let's do an example together to see if we can figure out the difference between polar and nonpolar molecules. What I'd like you to do is determine if the following molecules are polar or nonpolar. Methane with the formula CH4 and chloromethane with the formula CH3Cl. Pause the video and take a moment to try this on your own. And then when you're ready, play through and let's go through the solution together. So the first thing that we're gonna have to do is determine the structure of the molecule. Methane has a structure that looks like this. We've seen it before and we'll see it again. Chloromethane has a structure that looks like this. It's very similar to methane, except one of the hydrogens has been substituted for a chlorine atom. And so the chlorine atom has its six valence electrons around it, along with the covalent bond. For the record, I could have put the chlorine pretty much anywhere, but I chose to put it at the top, which is basically the convention. Once we have the structures in place, we can now figure out what the dipole moments look like. There are very, very slight dipole moments between carbon and hydrogen. But because of the structure in methane, each of those dipole moments is going in equal but opposite directions. If we look at chloromethane, we can see that the carbon-hydrogen dipole moments all point towards carbon, but the carbon-chlorine dipole moment points towards chlorine. As a result, they're not equal and opposite. Chloromethane is not symmetrical. Since methane is symmetrical, it's nonpolar. And since chloromethane is not symmetrical, it is a polar molecule. Does this make sense? If it doesn't, take a moment and write down any questions that you have before we move on. Polarity is really important for determining the intermolecular attractive forces that we see within a substance. When we consider the forces in a substance, we can think about the chemical bonds that hold atoms together as intramolecular forces, intra meaning within, and the forces between substances as our intermolecular forces. You may remember intermolecular forces from our discussions of phases and phase changes and why different substances exist at different phases at different temperatures. The general term for all intermolecular attractive forces is van der Waals forces, but we're going to look at three specific types of intermolecular attractive forces. We're going to look at London dispersion forces, we're going to look at dipole-dipole forces, and we're going to look at hydrogen bonds. Let's go in and take a look in depth. London dispersion forces, what we might call LDFs, are the weakest type of 
intermolecular attractive forces. They arise from temporary dipole moments. If you think about the electrons moving around a molecule, you could probably understand that there will be moments where there are more electrons in one region of the molecule and less in another. Because of that temporary unequal distribution of charge, you will get these temporary, very weak intermolecular attractive forces between the temporarily partially positive and temporarily partially negative regions of a molecule. Since larger molecules will have more of these temporary dipole regions than smaller molecules, the strength of London dispersion forces increases both with the size of the molecule and the surface area of the molecule. This graph is showing you the strength of London dispersion forces as represented by the boiling points of four different molecules that all have the general formula XH4, where X is a successive member of group 14 on the periodic table. So we're going down the group as we go from the left to the right on this chart. And you can see that the boiling point of these four substances increases as we do that. The reason why this is happening is because the strength of the London dispersion forces are getting greater as the size of that central atom increases. And there's a greater temporary dipole moment in each of these molecules. We can also see this by increasing the surface area of the molecule. As we go from left to right on this diagram, we can see that we have an increasing amount of surface area between the two molecules that we're looking at. As a result, our boiling points in these substances increase due to that increased surface area, leading to increased London dispersion forces. Does this make sense? If it doesn't, take a moment and write down any questions you have before we move on to our next type of intermolecular attractive force. Our next type of intermolecular attractive force are dipole-dipole forces. These are stronger than London dispersion forces, and these come from the interaction between partially positive and partially negative poles, the dipoles, of polar molecules. This graphic is showing you two different ways that we can get dipole-dipole forces between two different polar molecules. Notice that in each case, the force is between the partially negative and partially positive poles of the molecule. To go back to our intro graphic for this segment, the force that we see between these two molecules of HCl is a dipole-dipole force. Hydrogen is partially positive and chlorine is partially negative. That's where the force comes from. The force is stronger than London dispersion forces, but it's still comparatively weak when compared to the forces that are holding the atoms together within the molecule, the intramolecular force. Our final type of intermolecular force are hydrogen bonds or H bonds. These are the strongest intermolecular attractive forces, though they're still weaker than covalent bonds. These come from the attraction between the partially positive and partially negative poles of polar molecules, but only in specific cases. Only when those molecules are made out of hydrogen and fluorine, hydrogen and oxygen, or hydrogen and nitrogen. That's because these molecules will have the largest electronegativity difference between the atoms in the compound. And so as a result, if we think about all of the dipole-dipole forces, hydrogen bonds are just a subset of the larger phenomenon of dipole-dipole forces. Because they're so much stronger than regular dipole-dipole forces, we do consider them to be their own separate category. Particularly in the biological sciences, hydrogen bonds play a large role. This, for example, is water. You can see that water satisfies our definition for hydrogen bonds, since it's made out of hydrogen and oxygen. And you can see that each water molecule is capable of making up to four hydrogen bonds with its neighbor. This actually has some unique outcomes when considering the properties of substances in which hydrogen bonding is present. This graph shows the boiling points of three different substances in groups 15, 16, and 17 as we move down the periods. So you can see, for instance, in group 16, our blue line, we have H2S, H2SE, and H2TE. What we've done here is extrapolated what the boiling point of the substances in period 2 should be just by following the trend line. Let's look at what it actually is. The trend is not obeyed. The boiling points of water, hydrogen fluoride, and ammonia are considerably higher than they're predicted to be. And the reason for this is the hydrogen bonding that we see in each of these substances. Due to that hydrogen bonding, we have to put in considerably more energy to boil that substance than we would expect if we were just using the periodic trends. Does this make sense? If it doesn't, take a moment and write down any questions that you have before we move on. Polarity is a really important con concept that actually explains a lot of chemical behavior that's pretty commonly observed here on this planet. And it's also really important for the biological sciences, if for no other reason than the fact that the bonds between DNA nucleotides are actually hydrogen bonds. 
As we wrap up, I'll just point out two great charts that you have available to you in your notes. One is on page seven and the other one's on page six. Page seven takes all of the stuff that we've talked about since our first discussion and arranges it all together as a flow chart. So you can work through this chart and figure out what kind of substance we're talking about, whether it's a polar or nonpolar molecule, if we're talking about a molecular substance, and what the intermolecular attractive forces are that we'll find in that particular substance. The chart on page six actually describes and summarizes the different intermolecular attractive forces that we've talked about in this lesson, what kinds of molecules we'll find them in, what their strength is, and how it affects the boiling points, melting points, and vapor pressures of the different substances in which they occur. Thanks so much for watching our discussion of polarity. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you can determine if a molecule is polar or nonpolar based on its symmetry. Also make sure that you can determine the intermolecular attractive forces that will be present in a sample of a particular molecule. Finally, make sure that you can compare and contrast the different types of intermolecular attractive forces, London dispersion forces, dipole-dipole forces, and hydrogen bonds. If you can do all these things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have. You can always leave them for me in the comments below the video, and you can always get in touch with me through the information in the info field. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.